Turn right. Turn left. No backward skating. What the heck am I doing here? Well, I'm directing traffic. Yes, Doesn't someone have to do that on a skating rink? Think about it. Imagine telling someone who'd never been to a skating rink that you were going to let people strap blades to their feet and then let all of them, old people, young people, good skaters, bad skaters, speed around a rink. They'd say, no, you can't do that. It would be a catastrophe. You need to plan this. You need to direct them. You, speed up. You, slow down. Somebody pick that person up. So I'm trying, but it's not working. It's probably because I'm not a good enough skater like that guy. He's good. He should be the rink's president. Hey, he's Olympic gold medal winner, Brian Boitano. You, what would Brian Boitano in. do? You in the black right there. Please move to the outer edge along the rail. But his policing doesn't work either. Nobody was listening to him. I know, nobody was listening because they don't want to. I mean, they want to do their own thing. Yeah, it, it kind of ruins the fun of it. It's not going to be fun. What's the point of coming in? Good question. What makes a skating rink work is that you're free to skate pretty much wherever you want. People rarely collide because there's something called spontaneous order. Spontaneous order is what you get here and here on a dance floor. And in the animal kingdom, when birds fly together. And in most of life, when government leaves people alone. Our job is to do everything we can to ensure that businesses can take root and folks can find good jobs. Politicians think they should manage life. But politicians can't create jobs. They kill jobs with complicated regulations. Jobs happen when people are left alone to create things. That's spontaneous order. There are no limits to growth and human progress when men and women are free to follow their dreams. But mostly, the politicians want to control everyone's dreams. They want to dictate where your child must be taught. This woman created her own spontaneous order for her child and was jailed for it. How unfair. But at least one senator understands. When there's a choice between the government doing it and the marketplace doing it, we should always choose the marketplace. The marketplace is spontaneous order. And that's our show tonight. And now, the man who shatters conventional wisdom. John Stossel. Politicians act as if they know what the whole country needs. Last month, President Obama said, we need more passenger trains. Within 25 years, our goal is to give 80% of Americans access to high-speed rail. And yippee, the congressmen all applaud. But why? Politicians have promised that we'll commute on high-speed rail for years, but it never happens. And people like their cars. Okay, a few of us take public transportation, but often the trains cost taxpayers so much, and so few people ride them. Here's a passenger on Portland's mass transit. It would have been cheaper for the government to buy people taxi rides than to spend all that on their mass transit systems. The grand schemes of the politicians fail and fail again. And what's their solution? They promise to spend more money to fix those problems. And then they applaud themselves. By contrast, the private sector, without direction from Washington, gives us better stuff, much better stuff, for less money. My cell phone, my food, my clothing, they're all created through the free market, which works because of something called a spontaneous order. And here to explain what that is is economist Larry Reed, who had something called FEE, which stands for the Foundation for Economic Education. And we can use some economic education, so what's spontaneous order? Uh, John, spontaneous order is what happens when you leave people alone, when entrepreneurs arise and uh, see the needs in society, see the desires of people to satisfy their well-being, and then provide for them. They respond to market signals, to uh, prices. Prices tell them what's needed and how urgently and where. Uh, and it's infinitely better and more productive than relying upon a handful of elites in some distant bureaucracy who pretend uh, to know what they really don't. But this is just not intuitive because you know, leave us alone. I mean, if you look around, a lot of us are stupid. <laughs> and Obama's real smart and the people he appoints in Washington are very smart. You would think they would make better decisions. 
Well, you know, there's nothing about being in public office that suddenly makes you a better uh, foreseer. Okay, of the future. some of them are not smart, but a lot of them are. And so can't... Well, if they were really smart, then why aren't they trillionaires? Uh, they should be putting their own money uh, on the line. They should have proven their ability to see the future and respond to consumer demand by their own choices, their own investment choices. But, of course, these people really typically start making money for the first time when they go to work for the government. And even if they were geniuses, could they know what would work best for millions of people? No. In a market society, the bits of information that are needed to make things work, to, to result in the production of things that people want, are not known by a handful of people. They are interspersed throughout the economy. What brings them together are forces of supply and demand, of changing prices, uh, and, that, and politicians don't have sufficient incentive to respond to those things. There are so many examples. One is in France. They decided, hey, this new computer stuff, this is very important. So they gave, threw out all the print yellow pages and they gave everyone a computer instead of their 411 system. And all the press wrote about it was the Minitel computer system. France was going to lead the world. And it's gone. Well, hey, once you trust the government to provide these things for you, uh, you, you bureaucratize it. You stop innovation. All of a sudden, there's more incentive just to get by, do what you've always done, not respond to changing tastes on the part of, of customers. Uh, that's the way politicians respond, and they're more interested typically in pleasing com political constituencies than they are uh, the, the marketplace. So in France, it died, but in America, in San Francisco and Seattle, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're the cities farthest from Washington, D.C., emerged Silicon Valley. And That's right. And no politician, no bureaucrat, no central planner, no academic uh, sat behind a desk uh, before that happened, before Silicon Valley emerged and planned it. It happened because of private entrepreneurs responding to market opportunities. And the, the, one of the great virtues of that is if they don't get it right, they lose their shirts. The market sends a signal to do something else. When politicians get it wrong, you and I pay the price uh, uh, sometimes in perpetuity. And a good example of the spontaneous order is a skating rink. You'll, if you say to people, I think I'll s invent a sport and strap blades on people's feet and they'll zip around the ice at varying speeds. They'll have young people, old people all going. As they choose, people would say, no, they'll kill each other. There'll be chaos. Yeah. We need stoplights. We need someone to tell them, turn left, turn right. And yet you don't. That's a good example. And in fact, vast swaths of our economy are good examples to this day of the uh, power of spontaneous order. Look at all the crops that we don't support uh, with subsidies. You don't have to worry when you go in the grocery store that the shelves will be empty or that they'll be overstocked. There's always just the right amount, and it's not because of some commission or commissar that's directing it. I mean, an another way to understand spontaneous order is to think about this, this pencil. And I got this idea from a man named Leonard Reed, no relation to Larry, but he started Fee, uh, his organization. And he wrote, no one can make this pencil. Now that sounds seriously dumb, but think about it. No one person can make this. The wood comes from a tree in a forest miles away. Hundreds of people had to cooperate to cut down that tree and ship it to a mill where it was made into this wood. It took steel saws to do that. Making them required cooperation among thousands of people. Some had to mine iron ore, others melted that into steel and so on. Thousands of others produced the graphite, the eraser, the yellow paint, the glue that holds this all together. The power of that wonderful essay that's now 52 years old is that all the things needed to make something as simple as a pencil happen not because there's a commissar directing it, but because of market forces, the invisible hand, as Adam Smith uh, would once put it. And, I mean, let's clarify the invisible hand. You talk about the power of the pricing. Yes. What do you mean? Well, prices are important signal senders. They're information. Absolutely. Uh, when prices go up, they send a signal to producers. They basically say, hey, this make more of this stuff. That's right. More of it is needed over here instead of over there. If, if prices go down, it says you need to use scarce resources more wisely and make something else. Prices send signals that uh, con consumers and producers respond to infinitely better than they could possibly respond to the commands of elite politicians.
And this is why government limiting prices, price setting price limits is dangerous. It destroys those signals, absolutely. It you prices... don't get the information. That's right. You spent a lot of time looking at the planned economies of the Soviet Union. Weird things happened without honest price signals. Oh, absolutely. In the 1980s, I saw long lines for things as simple as uh, toilet paper. Uh, rarely would they get things like oranges or bananas. Uh, and I saw that uh, one of the leading causes of fires in Moscow apartments uh, was exploding Soviet-made television sets. Now think about it. This is a country where you've got the, the leadership says to make sure that people get TVs, we're going to have a television commissar, we're going to have a government factory. And the smartest people are going to run it? Yeah, and the result is they get fewer TVs and they explode than in a society where nobody is directed to make televisions and nobody goes to jail if they don't make any. But a bunch of us, maybe morons, working together will make better televisions than these elites could ever produce. Absolutely. That's the miracle of the marketplace. It's, it's uh, basic Econ 101. When you understand the message of that little essay, I Pencil, you realize that uh, it, it pays to be humble. There's a lot that we don't know in this world and a lot that we must trust to the uh, free interaction of other people rather than uh, some central planner. Well, I think we're pretty humble. It's the politicians who need to learn to be humble and leave it to people. Oh, amen to that. I mean, a again and again, they've tried this. It's not as though the verdict isn't in on central planning. Uh, I like to say that uh, uh, the central planners of the world try to make omelets, but they've never made one. They only break eggs. Thank you, Larry Reed, and thank you also for the seminars on economics and liberty that the Foundation for Economic Education runs for high school students and college students. Next, Republicans say they're for free markets. But what have Republican politicians actually done? Ronald Reagan's former budget director joins us to say Republicans have been the problem. Is keeping your floors clean a 